Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's good to see everyone here in, in Bethesda Church today. Let's affirm our faith. We'll do that today by the, with the Apostles' Creed. If you will stand, and we will recite together this traditional version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come, judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will continue to worship through song, Kumbaya, 494.
seated. Our scripture today is all from the New Testament. We turn to the book of Acts in the chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. The apostles and the believers in Judea heard that a non-Jewish people had accepted God's teachings too. But when Peter came to Jerusalem, some of the Jewish leaders argued with him. And they said, you went to the home of people who were not Jews or not circumcised, and you even ate with them. So Peter explained the whole story to them, and he said, I was in the city of Joppa. While I was praying, I had a vision. I saw something coming down from heaven. It was like a big sheet being lowered to the ground by its four corners, and it came down close to me. I looked inside. I saw all kinds of animals, including wild ones as well as reptiles and birds, and I heard a voice say to me, Get up, Peter. Kill anything there and eat it. But I said, I can't do that, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is not pure or fit to be used for food. But the voice from heaven answered again, God has made these things pure. Don't say that they are unfit to eat. This happened three times. Then the whole thing was taken back into heaven. And suddenly there were three men standing outside the house where I was staying. They had been sent from Caesarea to get me. The Spirit told me to go with them without wondering if it was all right. These six brothers also went with me, and we went into the house of Cornelius. He told us about an angel who had been standing in his house. And the angel said, Send some men to Joppa and get Simon, the one who is called Peter. He will speak to you, and what he tells you will save you and everyone in your house. After I began speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them as he came down to us in the beginning. Then I remembered the words of the Lord Jesus. John baptized people with water, but I will baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. God gave these people the same gift that he had given us who believe in the Lord Jesus. So how could I object to what God wanted to do? When the Jewish believers heard this, they stopped arguing. They praised God and said, So God is allowing even those who are not Jews to change their heart so they can have this gift of life that he gives. In the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared. Now there was no sea. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God and it was prepared like a bride dressed for her husband. I heard in a loud voice from the throne, it said, Now God's home is with the people, and he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, sadness, crying, or pain, all the old ways will be gone. Then the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write these, write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. The one on the throne said to me, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. I will give free water from the spring of the water of life to who anyone that is thirsty. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding 
of his word. If the ushers will come forward, we'll have our morning offering. Thank you, Gary. Well, good morning. morning. Are you glad to be here? So am I. I'm glad to be anywhere. Uh, Do we have any praises this morning? Have you seen God at work in your life this past week? Good. That's good. Yeah. Any others? I have, I have a couple I want to share. You know, uh, this past week, uh, there's a lady over at Kramer Memorial who is uh, at Abington Place, Martha Horton. Some of y'all probably know Martha. And Martha wanted her own bed instead of the bed that they had provided at the rest home. So several of us went over there to her house. We took her bed down and we carried it over to the nursing home. We took the bed down that was there and put her new bed up. And uh, there was about six or seven of us from Kramer Memorial that was there. There was some women there that they, they remembered to bring the sheets and put clean sheets on the bed and, and the bedspread and made it all nice and pretty. And <clears throat> anyway, Martha was kind of sitting back over in the corner watching us do that. And when we got through and the bed was made up, she looked at that bed and she just began to cry. She was so overjoyed with, with, uh, with joy. And, you know, it just done something to my heart, you know, to be able to, to do something as simple as just go move a bed for someone. And uh, it was just an act of kindness that, uh, that just touched her heart. And, and, and I could feel God's presence in that room. Uh, and so we prayed before we left. And uh, it was just such a wonderful experience. Uh, to be there and to be part of that. So uh, God is at work. He's so much at work in our lives. And then the other blessing was our confirmation class that we started uh, yesterday. It was a blessing. Uh, well, we had four confirmands, and uh, they, were, they were interactive, believe it or not. They didn't just sit there and be quiet. They, they asked questions, and they were involved. And so uh, I'm looking forward uh, to our time together to get to know our youth better. 
and to, uh, to help them to understand uh, what we as Christians believe, what we as Methodists believe. And there was even a few adults there that, uh, that also said they enjoyed it, that they learned a few things. So, uh, uh, so they're always welcome. Anyone's welcome to come. So uh, just seeing God at work in our lives. Uh, we also had a wonderful time sharing together last night over at Old Smire. We had a spaghetti supper. I saw many of you that are here over there as well. And uh, it was just a joyous time. Uh, they put on a real good feed. I'm always present for food. You know, it's, so uh, it was a great time, and we, we had a good time there last night. Uh, are there any others? Any prayer requests? I keep turning around looking for the choir, and the choir's not there. But uh, anyway, no prayer request. Everybody's healthy. Yeah, well, that's a big step. Okay, all right, we'll certainly lift that up. Is there any others? Absolutely. Any others? Do we have any unspoken requests just by a show of hands? I see quite a few. Well, let us go now to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all the things that you do for us. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that abides with us, speaks to us, and touches our lives in special ways. We thank you this morning that we could come into your house. We can come into this sanctuary, a place where we know that we are accepted. A place where we feel love for one another a place where we know that your Holy Spirit abides, a place where we can come and lift up our voices in praise to you, a place where we can come and pray. And Lord, it's a place where we know that you are present. You hear our voice. You hear our concerns and our needs. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for Jesus Christ and for his sacrifices and, and for the love that he has shown to us. To each and every one of us, we give you thanks. Lord, we also want to lift up those this morning that had special needs. Lord, we pray for Wesley Walker this morning and his, his back problems. Lord, we pray that the doctors will be able to give him treatment in whatever form it may be. Lord, we thank you for Gary and Kathy that are taking care of him. And we ask your blessing upon them. We also want to pray for Donna's son and, and his wife as they make a very important move, a financial obligation. Lord, it's no small task, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you will have your hand in that and give them guidance. Lord, we saw the hands that were raised this morning. We know that there are many that have special needs. Lord, you know each and every one. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we pray for each person that has these special needs and concerns. And Lord, we pray for our first responders, our police, firemen, our medics, those who come to us in times of need. We also want to lift up our president and all of his aides and all the politicians that make decisions that affect our lives. For our men and women in uniform, both here at home and abroad, protect them, O oh Lord, as they continue to Give us the freedoms that we enjoy here in this country. We pray for peace. We pray that they will be sent home and that there will be no more need for war. We pray for their families, that you would comfort them during this time of uncertainty, a time of, of, of not knowing the welfare and the whereabouts of their loved ones. And Lord, we pray for those this morning that are not here and present with us. Protect them. Bring them back safely to us once again. And Lord, we pray for this church. We pray that you will continue to raise us up. That we might be open. Our hearts and our ears and our minds will be open to your leading. Lord, that we will hear your voice. And we will respond in a way that pleases you. Oh Lord, we thank you 
for this place that we can come. A place where we feel secure. And oh Lord, we also want to lift up this morning those that are lost. Those that have rejected the church and do not know you. And we pray, oh Lord, that you will use the church. Use Bethesda, United Methodist Church. Lord, that we might be a light to a world that lives in darkness. That we might show forth the love of Jesus Christ in the things that we say, the things that we do. And Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now all of God's people pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good job. Thank you so much, Lucille. Beautiful. Our scripture, our gospel reading this morning is taken from the gospel of John, 
chapter 13, and it'll be verses 31 through 35. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Amen. Good to see you bringing those Bibles to church. John 13, 31 through 35. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for me, the Son of Man, to enter into my glory, and God will receive glory because of all that happens to me. And God will bring me into my glory very soon. Dear children, how brief are these moments before I must go away and leave you. Then though you search for me, you cannot come to me, just as I told the Jewish leaders. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should love each other, for your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, Peter got called in on the carpet, didn't he? See, Peter had gone up to Caesarea, and he had gone in and he had eaten with Gentiles. A big no-no. And then when he got back to Jerusalem, all the leaders there in the church of Jerusalem, they wanted to know why he had done that. He had to explain himself. Have you ever done anything where you had to explain yourself? Mm. I've done quite a few. I remember one time in particular, though, 1981, and it was in the fall of the year, and Susie and I had just built a new house. We hadn't even been in it quite a year yet. And back in those days, interest rates were outrageous. We were paying 12% interest on our home mortgage. And so we were struggling to get by. So I decided that I would burn firewood all winter long and help offset some of the energy cost. So I was always on the lookout for firewood. Well, that particular year, Belmont was cleaning off a big area for a ball field. And if any of you ever go into Belmont and you cross over the big bridge there on Park Street, you look off down in the gully, you see that field down there, that ball field's called Rodden Field. And that's where they were clearing off. And they had opened it up for anybody to come in and cut firewood. So I worked through the week, and so on Saturday, I decided I'd go down there and cut me a load of firewood. Well, I had a fairly new pickup truck, an F-100. And uh, I was really proud of that truck, and, and so uh, I'd taken it, and I asked Susie, I said, do you want to go with me this morning? She said, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'll go and sit in the truck and read my book. And I said, good. So we got in the truck, and I loaded up all my, my tools, and we took off down there to where that field was at. When we got there, nearly all the firewood was gone. The trees were gone. There was a few left way on the other side of the field, and if you went over there and cut them, while well, you had to carry the wood, you know, back across the field. There was no way to get the, my truck over there. But there was this one tree, huge tree, that everybody else had left alone. This tree would take three people to reach around it. And it was, it was standing there beside the road. And I told Susie, I said, look at there. I said, everybody save that tree for me. They were afraid to cut that tree down because it was so close to the road. I said, I know how to cut trees. I'm going to drop this tree right alongside the road and just be able to load this firewood right up here. So I got my stuff out and I parked the truck pretty close to the tree where Susie could sit and watch. And I started cutting on that tree. And I had a little old home light chainsaw that had a short bar on it. So I'd have to cut on one side of the tree and go around to the other side and cut. I had to move three different times to get all the way through that tree. Well, I've been cutting on this tree for a while, and finally, I'm on the back side cutting down on it. I got it notched out where it'll fall just where I want it to go. And all of a sudden, I'm cutting, you know, and, and the tree should start falling any minute, and my chainsaw just stops, and it won't cut no more. 
and I hear the tree beginning to crack, and it's coming back on me. And then I feel the wind blowing, and this huge tree is starting to fall back the wrong way. And it cracks and it pops, and I say, oh, Lord, let the wind stop blowing. But needless to say, that tree fell, and it fell across the road. And it fell so close to my truck that you couldn't walk between the tree and the front bumper of my truck. Susie's eyes were that big. I mean, she couldn't believe what she had just seen. Anyway, this tree falls across the road. And it falls on some transmission lines from a substation just up the street. And, and these, these lines are so big that the tree is actually hanging. And it's just kind of swaying on these power lines. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I'm just, I'm amazed. My eyes are as big as Susie's now. And I'm watching this tree sway. And finally, it falls. And when it falls, there's a telephone pole on the corner that snaps in two. And that telephone pole snapped in two and a transformer hit the ground and exploded. I mean, it was like a bomb went off. And there was these two guys that come around the curve there and they were in a truck. I found out later they were trying out a brand new truck from McKinney Chevrolet. And they bailed out on both sides. The power lines fell on the truck and kept the truck from going any further. But anyway, this transformer caused a fire. And it set the woods on fire. And, and you know what? It got really quiet after that. And I'm just standing there like, I can't believe this. And, and it got really quiet. And then you heard sirens. And the fire trucks came to put the fire out. And they couldn't get to the fire because the tree was across the road. So they had to go back into town and go all the way around into East Belmont and come around. By the time they got back over there, the woods would burn up. There was nothing left. Some of the firemen come over there and I was talking to them and they said, uh, said you know who done this? I said, yeah, I know who done that. He said, they're in a lot of trouble. He said, power's out in Belmont, shut the mills down. And even some Mills and Cramerton are without power. <laughs> then a guy from Duke Power arrived with a chainsaw. He said, do you know who done this? I said, yeah. He said, they're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> he, cut, he began to cut this tree up. Told me to just stay back out of the way. So I'm just standing there and I, I don't know what to do, you know. Anyway, this guy from Duke Fire, he's cutting this tree up. And, and finally, I asked him, I said, can I have that wood? <laughs> he said, I don't care. So I loaded up my truck and I left. <laughs> about a month later, about a month later, I got, I got some literature from Duke Power Company. It was a bill for $27,000. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I didn't have that kind of money. I was in debt. I'm trying to save money by cutting firewood. And here Doug Pyers wanting all this money. So uh, somebody said, well, call your insurance company. Call your homeowner. So I did. I thought it was a shot in the dark. But anyway, I talked to my state farm agent. And he said, so you cut a tree down and it fell on power lines and Doug Pyers suing you for money? I said, yeah. He said, don't worry about it. He said, state farm's got more insurance, got more lawyers than uh, Doug Pyers. I never heard another word. But I was held accountable for my actions that day. But you see, Peter was also being held accountable for his actions. He had had this vision when he was praying up on the roof about this sheet coming down from heaven with all these unclean animals on it. Now, what does that mean? And a voice told him from heaven, it said, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And he said, oh no, I'm not going to do that. I've never, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God had to tell him three times. You ever notice with Peter it takes three times? It takes me more than that a lot of times. I still cut down trees. But 
anyway, he tells him three times to kill and eat. And see, Jewish law, they had very strict dietary laws. And still do. Still do. And so it went against everything that Peter had ever been taught in his life. But God said, what I've made clean, don't you call unclean. And see, then, shortly after that, Peter was taken up to Cornelius' house in Caesarea. And Cornelius was a Roman centurion. It meant that he had 100 men under him. He was a highly respected man. But Peter realized that God was extending grace to the Gentiles. And as he began to preach to them and tell them about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit fell upon these these people, Cornelius and his whole family. And Peter was overcome with what he was seeing. Isn't it amazing what Jesus Christ makes new? Always making changes. So many times we get too comfortable with doing things the same old way. And that's exactly what was going on with the Jews. They couldn't understand. That's why when he got back to Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders of the church there in Jerusalem called Peter in and said, what do you mean going to the the Gentiles' houses? What do you mean staying with them? And you even ate with them? And Peter explained to them. Peter said, I have six men that I took with me as witnesses. In Jewish law, it only took seven men to agree to any one thing, and it was accepted. So the six he carried with him and himself made the seven. So the Jewish leaders there in the church in Jerusalem, they accepted what Peter said, and they were overjoyed that God had extended grace to the Gentiles. Folks, this is one of the most important stories in the whole New Testament. This is where we, Gentile people, are accepted in to salvation through Jesus Christ. It is so important that Luke, the writer of Acts, he tells this story twice. If you go back in chapter 10, you hear it the first time, and then you hear it again when Peter's explaining himself to the church in Jerusalem. And you know, in those days, they didn't have computers where they could just type it out and hit print and say two copies or three copies. They had to actually write it out on papyrus paper, on a scroll. And these scrolls were difficult to write on. So the story is so important that he writes it down twice. It's so so important that we, the Gentile people, understand that it was grace was extended to us through Jewish people, through Peter, because he heard God's voice. Speaking to him and telling him what he should go and do. So many times in the lives of of God's people, we hear God's voice, but we wonder if that's really right. If that's really something we ought to do. And we have doubts and we hesitate and we don't follow through. Many times it goes against the grain. Don't you think that this really went against the grain with Peter? I mean, this was something that he had been born, understood from the time of his youth. Not to eat these unclean animals. But here, God is shaking up the world. Turning it upside down. And God still does that today if we will just listen. He leads us into places that we wouldn't normally go. To do things that we might not normally do. See, John, the writer of Revelation, he tells us about this change. He tells us about a vision that he saw about heaven, about a new earth and a new heaven coming down, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And he explains this in chapter 21. So many times you hear this, these same passages preached at funerals because it gives people peace to know that, that Jesus and, and that God is going to wipe away all of our sorrows and all of our tears, that there'll be no more pain. But John was writing this to a people in the early church that was suffering great persecution. They had seen their family members and church leaders drug out and crucified and and beaten. 
fed the lions, all different types of persecution. But he writes this book of Revelation to give them hope so that they will understand that God still cares for us and he's providing a way for us. All things will become new. So many times we, we just don't grasp what he's saying about heaven coming down. You know, a lot of times you listen on the radio or you listen to some of these TV preachers and some of them, they, they, they preach on the book of Revelation and they want to tell you that they've got it all figured out. They know exactly what's going to happen when time is no more. They talk about a rapture where we'll be snatched up from heaven, I mean from earth, and, and carried off into the heavens. The book of Revelation does not say anything about a rapture. It talks about heaven coming down to earth. God coming to us. It says that God will dwell with mortals. So if you really listen to what John is saying in the book of Revelation, we're not going to be snatched up from this earth and taken to some far off exotic place. It's going to be right here. We see how beautiful the earth is now. Imagine when all things are made new. When there is no more pain. Is no more sorrow. And he says, and the sea will be no more. I had one girl say, oh, I don't like that. I like the beach. I don't want that to happen. Well, let me explain what that really means. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be a sea and a beach and all this kind of thing. Those people in those days were terrified of the ocean. They didn't have navigational skills. They didn't have GPS. They didn't even have a compass. So when they would navigate, they would usually just stay along the seashore and, and travel along the seashore, always within sight of land. But many times they would see ships leave port and never return. And there was always stories about sea monsters and people losing their lives. So they feared the ocean. It was, a, it was a place where that they were extremely afraid of. So when he talks about the sea will be no more, he's talking about all of your fears will be done away with. There will be no more fears. That's what he's talking about in Revelation when he says the sea will be no more. It means there will be no more fear. Nothing to fear. It's going to be such a beautiful, perfect place. John was writing this to give comfort to the early church. When they were going through so much persecution. Jesus talks in his gospel. About being glorified. And that can be a little bit confusing. Depending on what translation you're using. He's talking about that I'm going to be glorified. And God's glorified. And God's going to give me my glory. And all these different things. But basically what he's talking about. He's talking about first of all. His glory was when he came to earth. When he came here as just a child, incarnate. And then his second glory is the glory of his passion on the cross. His glory when he ascended back into heaven. And his final glory will be when he returns back to earth. That's what he's referring to here about all these different things about his glory and God being glorified. And then he gives us the new commandment. To love one another. I remember one day, I was still working at ABF. And I was standing in the driver's room, and there were these two guys standing in front of me, and they were talking about a friend of theirs. And I'm just going to use the name Pete. And they were talking about Pete. And they said, said, Well, do you think Pete's a Christian? He said, Well, I don't know. Do you think Pete's a Christian? Well, Pete says he's a Christian. Pete goes to church. The other one said, well, I don't know. Said, Pete does some things that I don't think Christians are supposed to do. And they keep arguing about whether or not Pete is a Christian. Finally, I can't stand anymore. And I said, I said, I'll tell you how you know whether Pete's a Christian. I said, does he love other people? Nah, Pete don't love nobody. And so then they began to judge. And I, I told them, I said, don't be a judge either. But you see, 
God's people love one another. I see love in this church. I see how people reach out and how they care for one another. I feel the love of this church and the other two churches as well. I tell the story of a lady that passed away at Lowell Smyre just a few weeks ago. She had no family. She'd never had any children. Her husband died about 12, 13 years ago. She lived alone. And she had a cousin and a nephew that lived in Florida. So she really had no one here. And she would struggle to come to church every Sunday. I mean, she would have, she's 89 years old. And she could barely walk, and she had fallen many times, even in her own home. But she loved her church, and her church loved her. She got sick, and she ended up in a hospital. She was in a hospital for about three weeks. And there was one lady from Lowell Smyre Church that got up and went to the hospital every single morning. Every day that she was in the hospital, this lady went to the hospital at 6 a.m., Every morning she was there at 6 a.m. She said, I want to be there when the doctor comes in because I want to know what they have to say about Miss Aline. Folks, that's love. When you sacrifice yourself. And she didn't just stay there till she heard the doctor. She would stay there till, till well after noon every day. She was staying there six and seven, eight hours a day giving of her time to be there with her friend, someone she loved. We had another lady that came in around 4 o'clock every afternoon. And she'd spend four or five hours with her in the evening. And then I remember it was just three days before she passed away. It was on a Sunday afternoon. It was her birthday. And they wanted to have a birthday party over at Peak Resources over in Gastonia. And half the church was piled into this little room. You know, people didn't know really what to say. They knew she was dying. But yet, they were there to show their love and their support. We sang happy birthday. We lit the cake. We all had a bite of her cake. She even was able to take a bite herself. But she knew that she was loved. And that's what Jesus Christ is talking about here. When he talks about... They will know you by the love that you have for one another. And I see that so much in our churches. Do you have love for one another? A lot of people say they love. But talk's cheap. Love is what you do. It's what you actually put into action. To me, love is an action word. And I see a lot of people here that do. They don't just talk. They do. And that's showing God's love. Thanks be to God for Christian love. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you for men like Peter and John. Lord, those, those leaders of the early church Lord, even when you turned their world upside down, they believed. They acted upon your calling. Lord, we pray today that, that our church here, the church of Jesus Christ today, Lord, that we will be obedient to your voice. Lord, when you call upon us to do things that seem just not right, give us strength. Give us encouragement that we might do the things that you call us to do. Lord, we know that when you call us to love one another, that it's the right thing to do. Lord, we thank you for Peter and for John and, and for all of those in the early church that bring us the, the rich traditions that we have today. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all those brave men and women Lord, help us to strengthen our faith that we too will be strong men and women of faith. 
Lord, that we will, that we will show love. Not just say that we love, but we will show our love for one another. The love that Jesus Christ showed to us. Lord, may we show that same love. In the name of the one who died upon a cross, who died for our sins, in his name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of response. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let us stand as we sing hymn number 170. Hymn number 170. Let us go forth from this place and let us show Jesus how much we do love by loving our neighbors. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.